Thank you so much. Good evening. I gladly accept the invitation for next year. Maybe you should wait to see what the product is, and then <laughs> I'm honored to be here. Uh, thank you for inviting me in this beautiful land full of history and beauty. Speaking of history, we were talking with Professor Cahill just a few seconds before starting, and uh, if I understand correctly, King Edward, uh, when he was thinking about all these castles around here, uh, not necessarily for all the castles he had in mind defense. Uh, he wanted to leave a sign that the king was there, which brings me straight to the topic of today, which has already been touched by Dr. Charkiv so, so well, that when we talk about procurement, we're not just talking about one goal. There might be more than one goal. And this is quite important, uh, and it's quite a forbidden debate in the European Union. Um, while, I will argue today, it's in full gears elsewhere, outside of the European Union. And I hope this conversation will help us to discuss about what the rest of the world is talking about, even, even if the current EU law does not allow uh, to switch immediately uh, toward a model that is widely adopted elsewhere. Because we need to think about procurement now, but also where we want to be 30 years from now. And I think it's useful to look around and, and, uh, and uh, discuss about uh, these issues. Uh, actually, it's not true that it's a forbidden debate in the European Union. It's a forbidden debate maybe in Italy, but I don't believe in coincidences. Two days ago, a student of mine sent me a, a, a URL from a website. She didn't know I was going to Wales. She just didn't know she was, I was going to Wales. And she turns out that uh, she said, you know this, this lady? I said, oh, no, I don't know this lady. Turns out she's a politician. From, uh, from Wales, and two days ago, she came out with a statement that got discussed a lot in Italy. I put it immediately on my blog, and there was a big discussion about this. And the topics that she raises, in a political way, obviously, she's not a procurer, were uh, touched today by Dr. Charvik, Dr. Perry Jones. Uh, here they are. Uh, Buy local. Oh my God! If you talk about buy local in uh, in Italy right now, you will, you you would be immediately arrested. Uh, uh, <laughs> terrible Germany. But again, also beside terrible Germany or fantastic Germany, look what they do. Uh, a goal, a goal, an idea of goal, and we've seen uh, target shares. I mean, we've seen numbers here confronting various areas, and uh, the, the 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 big topic that was already mentioned twice. The next 10 years are going to be frightening. I quote, I am really scared. The future seems extremely bleak. But the, the point that she raises and that we are all discussing is that maybe procurement can be a tool to reduce that fear. It can give us the, the resources by managing it correctly to face this crisis and maybe to get out of this crisis. Uh, and so I, I'm happy because this slide was not prepared. I put it at the last minute. But I'm glad to see that many of the topics are totally out there, out there, out there in the open. Uh, now, by local, I, I, I was asked to speak about SMEs. And by local has nothing to do in, in, in theory with SMEs, right? It's a different issue. It's protecting the national interest Why? Uh, SMEs are, are some sort of difference. It's really, it turns out it's really not true. Uh, presume that by, uh, forcing by local is forbidden, okay? And, it, and we know that explicit by local is forbidden. Uh, it turns out that uh, uh, if you think about SMEs, the issues can be uh, and of protecting SMEs, you end up, in a sense, protecting the national interest. In uh, imagine that you were to to think of. Uh, uh, switching to a mode where some tenders, science fiction here for Europe, that some tenders are reserved only to European SMEs. I will argue that the European SME, I mean, I'm not a lawyer, and so the lawyers will immediately kill me, I'm sure. But um, let, I will be killed less if I say European SME. But imagine that we were able to uh, allot some tenders in 20% of tenders in, in Wales and in uh, Italy to European SMEs. Well, it's tantamount to reserve them to Welsh uh, SMEs. No Italian SME will ever come 
to whales to participate, if you want maybe one or two. Okay? So we know very well that to talk about a European SME policy within each state is tantamount to talk about local preferences. Uh, uh, now, what would you need? And this is, I think, a, an, an important debate for lawyers. It's not my business. My business is what comes next in the next slides. I'm an economist. But uh, if, you, if you think about restricting to uh, European SMEs, I don't think this would require necessarily a treaty change. Why? It certainly would require a treaty change if we're talking about reserving slots for Welsh. But we know that uh, if you don't put the European dis uh, discrimination item there, maybe a new directive would be enough. Uh, unfortunately, the new directives, oh, the new directives. Let, let, let me talk about this in the, in the next few slides. It's such a sad, sad slide. Uh, but, but, again, for the lawyers, please let me know if we can't already do, with the current directives that we have, something for below threshold, for European SMEs, which amounts, again, to Welsh SMEs, Italian SMEs. I think lawyers should talk a little bit more about this, because this is uh, quite important. So, uh, why am I to I'm talking about a subject that is not well liked in Europe? Preferences. I am not a crazy guy. There's a few tiny nations, a few tiny nations that not only talk about preferences, they implement them. So let me just tell you which those tiny nations that, by the way, are not communist nations. Well, I take that back. I take that back. <laughs> I take that back because you will see it. OK. This tiny nation called United States of America, since 1953, through the Small Business Act and, small business, and the Small Business Authority, which I will talk again in the next slides, reserves 23% of federal procurement to SMEs. In the name of what? I will, I will tell you very soon. Small country. Small country. Uh, this is why I was wrong to say no, no communist, right? But last year, the Chinese have understood that, uh, I mean, the Chinese have also national preferences. Uh, and these are kind of different preferences. South Africa, for example, initially was uh, black-owned enterprises. Okay, now they're changing, so it's not necessarily only SMEs, right? India is back. I just came back from Austria from a seminar last week. And India, after having had them, after having removed them, has put them back in the line. Now, count, count the number of citizens that live in these countries. And you will understand that maybe the European Union is sort of a worldly exception to the rule. Now, maybe the European, I'm not saying that I'm not a conformist, I'm not saying that the rule is the right thing, but maybe we should discuss why a certain amount of countries adopt such rules, and in the name of what, so that maybe the debate can be created in Europe and we understand if we want to go towards this model or not. Uh, no. Uh, uh, well, we tried discussing it. There was a fantastic moment in which we were allowed rare occasion to discuss about the next European Union directive. It was the moment of the green paper when the European Commission sent out to everybody in the world, to all the universities, all the SMEs, all the large firms, these are our ideas. Please let us know what you think. My university wrote a paper, 60 pages paper. But if you go on the website to tell you how important and how rich and how interested people are in procurement. There's thousands of institutions, firms, small firms, universities, ministries that responded to the European Commission. And this was one of the sentences you could find. Why is it in red? Because it's been long forgotten after that. But it was there. This is another thing that was there. Using uh, SME's procurement for pushing innovation. These two things disappeared completely from the European directives. They're gone. Actually, it's interesting that if you go, now obviously the website of the European Commission has also the, the, the you can see all of the answers. 
it would have been fantastic to understand what the needs of the SMEs are to place the answers of the SMEs all in one location. No, they're all lost. So you will never be able to know what the SMEs really want unless you, write, unless you actually look for each single answer, right? But this we know. This thing has completely disappeared. It was one proposal that was never pushed forward. One thing you mentioned is, yes, there is some worry about aggregation. And we know that aggregation is rising because ICT is making aggregation easier. So correctly so, the European Commission worries about aggregation. Whereas, whereas in the US, uh, aggregation is plainly and truly discouraged. We will see that. But interestingly enough, what is the cure? I think you mentioned it. What is the cure for aggregation? Well, uh, public procurers will have to, in case of a big tender, will have to avoid that big tender and divide it into lots. Now, for whoever does procurement, everybody knows that if you have one large tender and you divide it into four lots, those four lots, one, they are still hugely, hugely huge for SMEs. Second, what happens when you have four large firms and you switch from one lot to four lots? It is a fantastic presence to the four, present to the four large firms that can collude even better than before. To put that explicitly in the rules is nuts, is crazy. Talk about creativity and leaving discretionality. Okay. There's less link to subject matter, more negotiations. Well, these are two things that the SMEs really worry about. Believe it or not, they expressed it, and it was in the green paper too. You mentioned simplification, and you were right. Limited turnover requirements. But these are not really something that help SMEs. They help all the firms. We welcome simplification. But do they help SMEs more than large firms? No, they help them the same. Now, you would, you would tell me, so why do we need to help SMEs more than large firms? We need to help everybody. Wrong. Plain wrong. But this is the answer why they do it. We know that the European Union is totally against preferences in the name of what? Well, in the name, what is the European Commission? The European Commission is the guardian of what principle? The lawyers call it principle, the economists don't call it necessarily principle, in the name of competition. So in the name of competition, you can't reserve shares of procurement to SMEs. Interestingly enough, it is in the name of competition that in the 1953, this is, like, this is one of the most beautiful laws I've ever written. It's from the beginning. It seems like a constitution. It's the 1953 Small Business, American Small Business Act. In the name of free competition, the Americans are saying, no, the field is not the same for everyone. We need to preserve competition, but not in the single award, over the long term. If we want that over the next 30 years, when I do a procurement, I face a bunch of healthy and many suppliers, well, I need to make SMEs thrive in an environment. And which environment? In the, env in the only environment that can protect them from the storm when they are small, like a little baby. Imagine you're taking a, you're a, a kid that is four years old to school and there's a big road to cross. Well, what do you do? You say you treat your kid four years old like the 18 year old that is going to school, you say cross it? No, you take it by the hand and you cross it with him. He learns how to do it with you. And when you're nine or 10 years old, if you don't want him to become uh, uh, with a, a few other problems, you, you, let, you let him go on his own. But he can go on his own because you taught him how to do it in the first place. This is the key difference between what is called protectionism and protection. If you talk to the Americans, they tell you, this is protection outright. This is not protectionism. Uh, obviously, the word that is, comes out is equal treatment, but equal treatment for equals. 
equal treatment for equals. Is one, we all know that for firms it is costly to participate to procurement. We need to have our employees work on the tender. We have to sacrifice three employees for the next six months to write the offer. Okay, so that's 100 euro for the large firm and 100 euro for the small firm. Is that 100 euro spent by the small firm the same than for the large firm? No, obviously not. In terms of unit cost, it is much, much more expensive for the small firm that will not be able to price it in the same way. There is no competition. There is no equal treatment at the beginning. This is why the Americans are saying, forget it. I know that it's impossible for a small firm to participate at that tender. I will create a share reserved only to them. Are they doing the right thing? Aren't they taking too many risks? Are there risks in doing such a policy? For sure, and we will see them. We certainly are avoiding that risk by saying, no, we don't want those preferences to, to be present. But how can you argue today that by simply saying, I will put the tender in the website, I will put the tender on the official journal so that everybody knows it, we have equal treatment of firms. Look at this. These are, this is the polling of <coughs> firms according to their size. That tells you, uh, uh, given one, consider one, if one firm responds, if one large firm responds, this is a problem for me, the first column, the first two columns, tells you what percentage, compared to the 1% of large firms, tells you that that's a problem for them. Well, look at that. Look at large contract value. If one large firm that says that large contracts are a problem, 22% small firms say that that's a problem. Look at tender fair tender evaluation. Hmm? The risk aversion that we were talking before. We're not talking about corruption here, risk aversion. If you have IBM and a small IT firm, well, I, I feel safer with IBM. We know that. So this tells you very clearly that at least the perception with these small firms is that the ground is not fair. Actually, the numbers turn out to be interesting enough. You were talking about numbers. So these are general numbers that were put out by the, by the European Commission. Uh, as you can see, if we compare the turnover in the whole economy compared to the amount that is allotted to small firms, there's a divergence. Why? Why? But this is a fantastic smoking gun for telling you that maybe we have a problem with the way we, we award the tenders uh, according to the dimension of the, of the firm themselves. How do, we, how, how do we face these problems in Europe? With good classical methods that we've been hearing today and that are very, very, very important. If you don't do this, then certainly you maximize problems for the small firms. The key question here is, once you've done all this, and so here there's a huge issue of competency, right? Is your procurement uh, office doing all these things? Is someone forcing the procurement office to do all these things so that the the difference in those costs that we've seen at the beginning between large and small firms, much higher for small firms, are at least reduced. And the gap, the competitive gap at the beginning is at least reduced. Uh, can you do other things? Well, as I told you, and I'm going to skip those slides, but there are uh, other countries that go through the method of preferences. Okay? Preferences might mean two things. It might mean set aside, i.e., to this standard, only a small firm can compete. Or preference could mean a large firm will win only if, we'll, if it will do a discount that is X percent higher than the discount done by small firms. These are two instruments, set-asides and discounts, that are, very much, that are totally used by those countries that I've showed you before. But they're not here, set-asides. Oh, just, just, to, just to give you a sense, when you say, oh, well, set aside, just to give you, this is a good example, because when, when you say set aside, you're saying, well, if I set aside for a small firm, I give up on having large firms. So I give up probably on competition. So, for example, I might uh, 
pay a higher cost. But look at this example. This example tells you, imagine that you have four lots and that you reserve one to small firms. Well, what's going to happen in the other three lots? Well, the other three lots, they're going to see much more competition from the large firms than they would have had had the four lots been reserved to them. So it's not clear at all. It's not clear at all that the results, thank you, that the results are going to be higher cost if you protect the SMEs, even in the single tender. There's other uh, important impact. One is that we know that if there is something really important for small firms is the issue of financing to go into a tender. And we know that the cost of financing is much higher typically for small firm than for large firms. Sometimes that higher cost is, has a reason, has a rationale. Sometimes it has not a rationale. And in that case, you are correcting an inefficiency in credit markets by reserving a tender to a small firm. The other thing that the Americans have in mind is even if this tender is going to be more costly because I reserve it to a, to a small firm, maybe in the future, my tenders in the future will be cheaper because I will have more actors participating in it. That's an item that is practically impossible to measure. But that doesn't mean we don't, we ha don't have to keep it in mind. It's very important to keep it in mind. A field with a greater amount of uh, actors. Obviously, there are a huge amount of risks. And these risks are obviously very clearly in the mind of the European leaders, since we don't see preferences are set aside for small firms. The typical, the typical risk is obviously that if you say to a large firm, no, you can't compete, it's true that maybe the price goes down uh, because you have higher competition, but maybe you, uh, you have higher competition on the other lots, maybe. But in many cases, it might happen in that specific tender that you award to the small firm, the cost is going to be high. Uh, this guy, Bates, he wrote a fantastic history of what happened when in the 1970s, following the civic, civic civil rights movements, black mayors started to be elected in the area densely populated <laughs> by black population. For example, Chicago, Illinois. What did they do when they were elected, these mayors? They started doing the right thing, like Spike Lee would say. They started reserving procurement to black-owned enterprise. And you know what happened? A mess. Why a mess? Because many of those firms have never worked. There were some sectors that were totally close to black firms, he tells. Some, for example, the Chinese, it's not that the Chinese were good only at restaurants and barbers, he says, but it's why were they doing only restaurants and barber shops? Because that's the only two sectors in which they were allowed. Same thing here. So you have a huge cost. If you ask a small firm to do a job that they're not really capable of doing, while a large firm has always been able to do it, you must be prepared to pay an initial cost. Obviously, that initial cost comes back to you because that small firm that has learned to the business with you, maybe one day will become that small firm that will sell its products worldwide because it has learned how to do business. It's very complicated to measure, again. Uh, uh, my friend Chris Eukins at George Washington University always says, this is a nightmare of bureaucracy. I'm almost done. Uh, once you put preferences, you create a ministry for, for SME's bureaucracy, and it never goes away. He might have a point. He, he knows that uh, the Small Business Authority has become like a minister, and maybe it is bureaucratic itself. But keep in mind, in the US, after nine years, the kid has to cross the road on his own. It is not a permanent, let's call it subsidy in a sense. If you have taken advantage for nine years of this system, after nine years, that's it. You can't be participating to tenders that are reserved for you. You need to cross the street on your own. The incredible thing, America is full of economists that study, we don't yet have a study on the most important thing, 
All these firms that for 60 years have been helped by the US government, where are they now? What kids are they? Are they kids that know how to cross the street very well, capable or not? We don't have studies. It would be very important to have studies on these issues. This is a huge problem. Fraud. Many large firms in Brazil, for example, now, what have they done? They, per they have created artificially very many small firms. And they participate to tenders. And in a corrupt environment, that might be really backfiring. So you might want to keep this very much in mind. Uh, and many times, the preferences are written by the dominant lobby. So what, I, what I'm saying is basically this. Let's talk about these issues. Because there where you don't have a problem with corruption, there where you have competences, these things might be extremely useful to sustain the economy during a crisis, but also to sustain its competitiveness. Let's talk about it. Let's face the issue. Let's ask ourselves if we really are interpreting things right when we talk about competition in a different way the rest of the world does. If the environment is very prone to corruption, well, then set aside, in my opinion, can become a true nightmare and a way to reinforce corruption. Let me just say one more thing. In America, Whenever a large agency procures, the US government sends to this administration a guy called the ambassador of the small firm. This guy is in charge of checking every procurement tender that the large administration does and stop it if he sees that that tender is done in a way that it will compromise the ability of SMEs to participate to the tender. You know what happens to these guys? I, I, I spent 15 days at the Small Business Administration. You know what happens to this guy? Every two years, they have to switch place. You know why? Because they hate them. <laughs> they are hated. But they have an incredible amount of power to stop tenders. And so these administrations have to discuss with these ambassadors if the tender has been written in such a way that SMEs can compete in a fair way. Can we do this? Can we take the interest of the SMEs in the public administration in a way that is more vocal, more direct? I think that's part of, uh, of the job that you with the university will have to do. Uh, it's a fantastic thing. Let me just close with one thing. I didn't know you were signing a memorandum of understanding. <coughs> We as, econom as economists uh, love to work on procurement, especially when there are data. Data on public procurement do not exist because data are power. And when there is power involved in public procurement, people are scared. These three researchers, two at the London School of Economics and one at my university, had the luck or the skill to find this huge data set of all Italian public procurement for four years. So they were capable of documenting, and it was published in the American Economic Review, the most important newspaper uh, journal for us economists. They were able to document that this ledger, it's called ledger, right? Was bought the same day by different administration at very different prices. It's called waste. They document the amount of waste that in Italy occurred between 2003 and 2007. It is 2.1% of GDP, i.e., what would have happened if everyone had bought this one at the lowest price? But most importantly, <clears throat> most importantly, the result that they find for them, the reason why the paper was published is that they can tell in Italy what share of that waste was due to corruption and what share of that waste was due to incompetence. In Italy. So when I say this to in Italy, everybody starts laughing because in, when I say that to Italians, because obviously the stereotype is that it's 100%. <laughs> Corruption. <laughs> Turns out, and, this is, and they were astonished too when they found this result, 83% of the waste is due to incompetence. Now, if 83% of the waste is due to incompetence, it's fantastic news, because corruption is much harder to eradicate. 
incompetence, you sign the memorandum of understanding, and you go ahead. Obviously, not, no, not only studying the law, because once you have done things by the book, then the job of the procurer starts. There's thousands of dimensions that have nothing to do with what's written in the law that have to be done right. So this is why the master is so important, because it's interdisciplinary. So I commend very much this fantastic thing that this memorandum of understanding is starting, and I'm very jealous that uh, we're not capable of doing it in the same way in Italy. Thank you so much.